so we're on to scene 14 the great white throne thank you for tuning in on this friday have a drink of my coffee and get started okay and i perceived a great white throne and him who was sitting upon it from whose face heaven and earth fled and no place was found for them and i perceived the dead the great and the small standing before the throne and scrolls were opened and another scroll was opened which is the scroll of life okay so understand this the great white throne has nothing to do with sin sin was taken care of christ came he paid that price at that stake at that roman stake for all sin so this takes in the whole scope of the world okay every single human being that ever existed since adam he took it away at that cross so the great white throne has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with sin. <clears throat> I want to get that right out of, of the um, situation completely when it comes to the great white throne. They're judged in accord with their acts. Okay? So the scrolls that were open, that are open at the great white throne, they're going to be actually having to do with acts. <clears throat> and I believe it's how they treated the members of the body of Christ, to be honest with you, and what they did in, in, in the sense of blaspheming God. And you look at the Christ, Christianity as a whole, um, they're going to have the most severest judgments because they're blaspheming God. They don't even teach the true God. And they're duped by Satan. So there you go. And that'll be opened up at the great white throne. And like I said, it has nothing to do with sin. It's the acts of the person. That is being judged <clears throat> and that and the other scroll which was open was the scroll of life so that's going to be the scroll of life where they receive eonian life in the last eon uh the new heavens or the new earth spiritual beings the new heavens and human beings the new earth and if their names are written in there they'll receive this and the dead were judged by that which was written in the scrolls in accord with their acts and the sea gives up the dead in it. And death and the unseen give up the dead in them. And they were condemned, each in accord with their acts, not sin. And death and the unseen were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's the second death. It's the same as the first death, only it's the second death. Oblivion. Absolute oblivion. They go to the second death. Gone. The next second for them. And the next conscious moment for them will be the consummation, however long that last eon is. And if anyone was not writ found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Okay, the judgment before the great white throne takes place at the end of the thousand years. This is the time when the majority of the dead are raised, those who are not of the former resurrection. Revelation 25, 5 and 6. Let us note, the acts form a basis of this judgment. Grace has no part in it, and neither does sin. <clears throat> it is a judgment on merits, and the immediate results are not favorable to those being judged. It is a fundamental truth that the just by faith shall be living. Romans 1, 17 Galatians 3.11 and Hebrews 10.38. But these being judged here have neither the righteousness nor the faith to qualify them for life. Hence, they go into the second death, which is neither endless annihilation nor eternal torment, but a means of purification to enable them to be vivified at the con conclusion of the eons. And I wouldn't call it a purification process like um, the Catholic thing. What's that? Jeez. Uh, Purgatory, yeah. So it's not like that. Um, they're dead, they're dead, period. Um, I kind of see how it could be um, the elements in the sense of DNA being adjusted by God, of course. Um, 
there's no feeling in death. So the process of the lake of fire, if there is a process of purification, then it has to do on a molecular level, I believe. <clears throat> That's just my own sur surmising of it, but we won't go there. The whole point is, is that it is death, oblivion, unconsciousness, non-existing. That's exactly what it is. The lake of fire is obviously a symbolic of expression, for death and the unseen are both cast into it. Those of the former resurrection are not in any way involved in this judgment, for their future was decided a full thousand years earlier. And on them, the second death has no jurisdiction. And certainly believers in, the day, in this day of grace, who form the ecclesia, which is the body of Christ, will not be involved. For they will have been caught up to meet the Lord and will be together with him, as we saw earlier. We now pick up their position again. Okay. So, back in scene 12, we said that, th that through the ecclesia, which is his body, Christ continues that great work begun at the cross of reconciling all to God. And we'll go on to scene 15 here. Our last picture was one shows, but one shows the reconciliation of all accomplished. The whole universe being made subject to Christ and headed up into him. It is again the Apostle Paul who widens the scope of God's operations to include the heavens as well as the earth. In Ephesians 1, Christ is shown at God's right hand among the celestials, up over every sovereignty and authority and power and lordship, subjecting all under his feet. We would emphasize that the heavens have to have to be subject to Christ. And that insofar as a continent is greater than a grain of sand, so this is an infinitely greater work than subjection on earth. The whole universe through the ecclesia will be brought back. The subjecting work is done by God. 1 Corinthians 15, 27. But the reconciling work, which accompanies the subjecting is done through Christ and the Ecclesia. Ephesians 1, 23. Let no one imagine that all in the heavens are already at peace with God. There are sovereignties there, and authorities and powers and lordships, which aim at usurping his power and authority. These are the spiritual forces of wickedness among the celestials, with which we are called upon to wrestle with, which we do. Ephesians 6.12, God has provided the sovereign of the celestials, just as he has provided the king of the earth. In each case, it is the son of his love. Colossians 1.18, he is sovereign, and anyone choosing another is rejecting God. God made this principle plain in Samuel when, when Israel first asked for a king. 1 Samuel 8.7, it is because of all this insubjection among the celestials that there is there has to be a new heavens as well as a new earth the lord has said for behold me creating new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered nor shall they come upon the heart isaiah 65 17 peter saw the present heavens passing by with a booming noise and the elements dissolved by combustion but was hoping for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness is dwelling. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. Again, John saw in a vision a new heaven and a new earth for the former heaven and the former earth pass away. Revelation 21, 1. What do you think of God, of a God who makes everything afresh so that there it shall be no trace of any of the sins and sorrows and mistakes of the past? No disturbing memories to mar the happiness of the future. But the unruly inhabitants of the heavens have to be made subject to Christ, that all may be headed up in him, both that in the heavens and that on the earth. Ephesians 1.10 That in the name of Jesus, every knee should be bowing, celestial and terrestrial and subterranean. Philippians 2.10 That all may be reconciled to God, whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. Colossians 1.20 
Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians all tell of the same great work among the celestials as well as among humanity, in which it is the lot of the ecclesia to have a glorious part. Do you realize the grandeur of your allotment in Christ? Do you realize that it is through the ecclesia, which is his body, his complement, that he is able to complete the all in all? Ephesians 1.23 Do you realize that it is in the ecclesia, as well as in Christ Jesus, that God is to find glory for all the generations of the eon of the eons? Ephesians 3.21 so, the eon of the eons, which is the last eon. Now, it says generations. Wow. So, you know it's a very long time. It doesn't say specifically how long that last eon will be. It could be millions and billions of years. Who knows? It doesn't specifically say. And would it matter? It won't matter to us. I mean, time and space is just irrelevant when it comes to the body of Christ at that point. because we enter into time and space in the physical universe to reconcile beings or we stay among the celestials which is above time and space and reconcile those celestial beings <laughs> so there you go but we have access to the whole of the universe including the earth that's what I love about it is because we can come back here at any moment and if our loved ones are not believing in this lifetime we can protect them at least Right? At least until the time of judging. It doesn't matter. This is God's operation. Through the Ecclesia and through Christ our head, our brother. The gift of grace given to the Ecclesia in Christ Jesus before the eons began. Get that part. Before the eons began, we were given this. 2 Timothy 1.9 Finds its full expression in the ministry of the Ecclesia, throughout the eons of the eons. So, the last two eons. When its members display the grace of God in all its fullness. Ephesians 2, 7. The basis of this display is the grace which the Ecclesia itself has received at the hands of God. This is shown to us in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Twice the apostle declares that in grace are you saved. And this is not out of us. It is entirely of God. It is because of this that we are in a position to display the transcendent riches of God's grace in a way that otherwise would be quite impossible. <clears throat> this is the essential factor behind the ministry of the Ecclesia. God's, God graces Christ with a name which is above every name because he is worthy to receive the honor. He graces the Ecclesia with a salvation and an allotment of which, individually, all its members were quite unworthy. In the ministry of Christ and his ecclesia, humanity, too, finds its highest and noblest expression, and the reason for its being created in the image of Elohim is demonstrated through Christ. <clears throat> for Christ, having come to be in the likeness of humanity, Philippians 2, 7, and being found in fashion as a human, Becomes, the, becomes, with resurrection, the first of the new humanity. And the Ecclesia, as his complement, also becomes part of the new humanity. The attainment of the measure of the stature of the complement of, of the Christ is coupled with mature manhood in Ephesians 4, 13, and 14. And we only reach this state by putting off the old humanity with its malpractices and putting on the new which is in accord with God, is being created in righteousness and benignity of the truth. Okay, so tomorrow we'll go with scene 16. Okay, and I also found scenes 1 through 12 from the Unsearchable Riches, so I will be going over those as well. Um, have a beautiful Friday, grace and peace.